Hi, I'm at Tamora Airport and I'm going to take a look at the Tamora Aviation Museum, which is really cool because they have all of their planes here are fully operational, all their historical aircraft. So we're going to go check them out. So let's go in and find out. It's an operational um, airport, so they do hold regular air shows here, but uh, their big ones coming up in October 2024. So I think I'll be there for that, but let's go into the... Uh, engineering hangar it's where they uh, maintain all of these aircraft because every aircraft you're about to see is fully operational they fly them they like to fly them at least once a month and uh, this is not the only part this is there's another hangar with even more but uh, check this out this is a Lockheed Hudson so the Lockheed Hudson this was actually a uh, it's not a military aircraft or it wasn't originally it was a civilian aircraft which they are uh, converted into a military aircraft in uh, 1941 they added the uh, the massive twin gun uh, turret on the back and no you couldn't shoot the uh, tails off as it was an automated lockout from when you swept it around although I did hear that uh, they did occasionally it wasn't 100% effective but uh, anyway um, yeah and what um, this particular one was uh, used for this was from the um, from the US but it was uh, bought by the RAAF and then uh, converted for uh, anti-submarine uh, warfare and this was one of the first anti-submarine warfare planes and you can see these antenna which they fitted on the side here, they are uh, these dipole jobbies, they um, actually use this for um, very early uh, dropped uh, sonar boys. So yeah, um, this is one of the first anti-submarine uh, patrol aircraft which uh, patrolled northern Australian waters and uh, that's what it's used for but they also uh, they ripped out all the seats in there and you could add um, like uh, they added like bomb uh, bays on there and you could actually uh, drop them out so it was converted into a bomber but so it was also used for bombing and uh, aerial uh, like armed uh, reconnaissance and stuff like that so it's a very nice aircraft and yes they still fly this thing it, <laughs> it is still they they've got a whole hangar full of uh, spare parts for this and they do manufacture their own uh, parts for it but uh, yeah this is uh, one very was one very capable aircraft and then after the war it was uh, used for uh, topological mapping of you know like half of Australia or something like that it just flew grid uh, patterns around and would uh, yeah do topological mapping of the outback and stuff so anyway it's still operational today the guns don't work of course uh, they you wouldn't get a uh, license for those but uh, it's got all original uh, instrumentation inside the only thing they've upgraded is the radios and that's it but yeah that's a very cool aircraft the Lockheed Hudson Mark 3 I thought it was a Mark 2 it's actually a Mark 3 jobby beautiful and tucked in behind there you can see a Cessna A37B Dragonfly and uh, this was used for, during the uh, Vietnam War and this was a hugely fast and capable uh, ground attack aircraft sorry I got a video playing next to me this sucker would do 770 k's an hour and uh, it was yeah like a low level ground attack aircraft you basically couldn't touch this thing well um, I think we'll have a look at the engine um, out of this one uh, later we can see that but yeah that is a hugely capable aircraft and it was very flexible in uh, terms of armament you had 30 millimeter cannons 20 millimeter cannons you had uh, 7.62 millimeter mini guns you had um, mark 82 uh, bombs in it you could have uh, sidewinder you know, the earlier am9 sidewinder missiles on the thing for a bit of air-to-air -air, um, stuff but it was basically a uh, ground attack um, aircraft and it was highly regarded uh, during the Vietnam War so yeah the Dragonfly beautiful bit of kit and the twin J85 engines in this thing um, they, they still make these today so they this one actually is fitted with new uh, engines and they said they just um, they bought new engines off the shelf and they just dropped them in and it worked a treat so yeah the exact same engine all they've upgraded is the electronics in the engine and that's it but the actual engine everything about it is exactly the same as it was back there you can still buy it off the shelf incredible and you can't really see it all that well but uh, yeah, out in the back there is a Cessna 02A once again um, used in the uh, Vietnam War and it's, it's actually a push-pull uh, configuration so you'll see the rotor on the back there but it's also got one 
on the front. And uh, yeah, that was uh, used in Vietnam for uh, low level reconnaissance um, stuff. So it was, um, they would, you know, drop uh, marker flares down and uh, to, you know, and it had a hugely capable comm system in there. That was basically the, um, the airborne command center for, for the Vietnam War and they would actually direct, they had the capability for in the plane to actually direct the uh, troops and other uh, things all around. So they dropped the flares of where they, you know, wanted uh, where the enemy was and where they wanted them to move to and they can call in, uh, you know, strikes and other things. So, yeah, basically um, they had full autonomy to uh, uh, basically uh, command anyone on the battlefield. So that was a very capable bit of kit. And we have ourselves a Martin Baker Mark I ejection seat. This is the old school uh, original jobby and uh, yeah you'd be uh, whacked out of the plane with your explosive charge at uh, up to 30 G's so yeah this was not a pleasant one to be ejected from but it's uh, better than buying the farm and auguring in I guess um, but yes a lot of people came out of the <laughs> out of this thing uh, with yeah a lot of uh, like spinal injuries and neck and uh, injuries and stuff like that but uh, yeah then the um, of course they upgraded with the multi-stage um, ones in the Mark, you know, the Mark III and stuff like that, which is, uh, but anyway, Martin Baker ejection seat, yeah, that saved a lot of lives, so that's one of the originals. All right, let's go into the main aircraft display hangar, and oh, they got some Bobby Dazzlers in here, let me tell you. Wow. And once again, these are all fully operational. They still fly every one of these, and here is the Canberra bomber, and they yeah, it's the only operational Canberra bomber left in the world. So this is absolutely fantastic. Nothing flew higher or faster than this. Um, I do believe this particular one carried um, tactical nukes back in the, uh, the start of the Cold War. But basically this sucker would go a thousand kilometers an hour and uh, could fly at normally 60,000 feet, but it could do up to 70 thousand feet but uh, it wasn't air conditioned inside so you get bloody cold out of this thing but uh, yeah it's absolutely incredible I think it had a range of 6,000 kilometers so you get you know six hours at your thousand kilometers an hour but uh, it's a beautiful looking plane Canberra bomber and you would actually lie down the uh, it, it was a three-man aircraft so you'd have your pilot you'd have your nav and the bombardier would actually lie down in here it's probably hard to yeah, you can't see it sorry yeah, it's a it's a bit hard to see inside that window but uh, with the glare but anyway the bomber <laughs> the bombardier would uh, lie down flat and look out the windows down the bottom there's a rear there should be a bottom port yeah there it is so you'd look down there and um, it was a hugely capable bomber the Canberra bomber nothing flew higher or faster than this thing for a very long time. And as I said, this sucker is still operational. They take it out like every month and they fly this bad boy. Unbelievable. They claim 933 k's an hour, but I've heard it can do over a thousand. So yeah, it's um, there are four 340 kilo uh, bombs in there, but it could actually carry tactical uh, nukes as well. I'm sorry, I'm not sure what uh, type they were, but early in the Cold War, back in the uh, uh, late 40s, early 50s, um, yeah, these would uh, these would carry tactical nukes in the uh, European theatre, I believe it was. So yeah, that is one beautiful, sleek bit of kit. I really like that. The Canberra bomb is absolutely fantastic. Um, and yeah, as I said, the only operational one left in the world. Wow. And there's the tail end of that bad boy. Wow, look at that. Fantastic. And yeah, they just wheel it out of the hangar. Um, <laughs> unbelievable. Yeah, they still fly these things. I just can't believe it. Everything in here is operational. But yeah, that's the Canberra bomber. And then we've got an old school tiger moth here. This would be your uh, two-seat trainer, so you're training your tiger moth, uh, stick and rudder stuff. No fly-by-wire rubbish here, you'd uh, get every feedback in this. 
and say, yeah, that's a two-seat trainer. Got another Wira away over here, another classic aircraft, quite capable. It was a uh, two-seat trainer. So this was actually capable of action. It had uh, two 303 Vickers uh, machine guns on it, and it could actually uh, carry a couple of 500-pound uh, bombs as well and a couple of uh, 250 pounders but it was basically a uh, trainer a two-seat advanced uh, trainer aircraft for the military but you know if push came to shove you could actually get this into action and just a classic uh, tiger moth here and needs no more introduction everyone's familiar with the tiger moth um yeah of course not a uh, really a military uh plane but uh yeah a, you know general aviation plane very popular uh trainer and stuff like that and and this sleek looking bad boy is a Ryan STMS2 this is a uh, once again a two seat uh, trainer wasn't uh, armed at all uh, but it doesn't look like <laughs> it's like steampunk so if you yeah if you wanted something sexy to fly back there look at this it's just beautiful ah oh, look at it it's glimmering and you should have recognized this it's the supermarine spitfire this is actually uh the mark 16 which is uh not that common this is actually a ground attack um aircraft as opposed to the uh, common mark 8 which they've got over there that's the uh that's the one that they produced uh the most of and that's your classic uh uh, you know air to air spitfire but this is a primarily an air to ground so it's got uh tw oh, no. i think it's got uh three times the amount of uh 20 millimeter cannon ammunition in here it's uh got twice the amount of uh fuel as the mark 8 and yeah it was just designed for a uh, an entirely different role air to ground once again this is operational they're all operational they just it's got the still got the tags on it take them out when you want to take it out for a fly this would be absolutely fantastic. Classic Spitfire. Spitfire, just a beautiful aircraft. But yeah, they had so many versions of this, but the most common was the Mark 8 and I think another one. But uh, this one, um, they produced quite a lot of them, actually. I can tell you. What does the info sign say? Oh, 1,700 horsepower. This one's actually owned by the uh, Royal Australian Air Force. Um, so technically, um, yeah, the, they're the owners. I'm not sure who actually flies it. I assume uh, they do. Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of competition amongst the uh, pilots to get out and fly a, uh, a classic Spitfire like this. But yep, they own it. And USA, USA, USA. This particular one was made in 1944, built in Birmingham in the old Dart, and uh, served with the Royal Australian Air Force uh, during World War II in, in over uh, Europe. So this one actually um, saw action and still flies today. Isn't it beautiful? Ah, oh, look at that. The size of the props on these things. What are they, 16 footers? Unbelievable. That's one beautiful aircraft. Now we get into the jet territory. Look at this. We've got a Meteor, Gloucester Meteor. Um, short, stumpy wings on this thing. Look at them. They're as thick as they are long because um, they're, the, uh, they're all the fuel tanks in there. And uh, yeah, this was a very, the Meteor was a very capable jet back in the day. So the Meteor, uh, one of its primary roles was to actually shoot down during the end of the war um, German V-1 rockets because this one was faster than the V-1 rockets and uh, it could actually shoot them down. And thats I don't think this uh, particular one did, but yeah, that was one of the roles of the Gloucester Meteor. That's what it was called into service to do was to uh, yeah, take down the German V-1 rockets. So yeah, they weren't untouchable. The, uh, the Meteor could actually shoot them down no worries and it was used in the uh, korean war as well against um the mig 15 and which was you know a classic troublesome um yeah it was a, a death trap basically the uh, mig, mig 15 but it was phenomenal when it came out but yeah this was uh saw action against uh, some mig 15s in the korean war so you can see the cannons on the side there it actually has two on the other side so it's got four 20 millimeter cannons or it could carry two 2,000, uh, thousand, two 1,000 pound bombs or a um, eight uh, rocket launcher, uh, by eight rocket launcher uh, pods as well. But yeah, this sucker would shoot down German V1s. Whoa, beautiful. And the Meteor was uh, the first jet purchased by uh, the Australian Air Force. So 
this was our first, uh, you know, capable jet. So I'm not sure of the history of this particular one, but uh, yeah, was owned by the Australian Air Force and then. And on from that, you might think this is a F-86 Sabre, but it's actually not. It's the RAAF CA-27 Sabre, and it's actually quite a significantly different um, aircraft because what we did was uh, purchase the uh, plans for this thing, but they didn't give us any tooling or anything else. So we had to <laughs> make it ourselves. So what they did is they redesigned this based on a different engine, and it's actually um, a couple of inches wider the uh, fuselage to and use a totally different engine and uh, different airflow intake in here. Um, so it actually, um, whereas the F-86 had a straight airflow intake, this one actually snakes up and over, or so, you know it goes in and then snakes up and over like that. And it's uh, a couple of inches wider. If you get a pair of calibers on there, you would uh, find that yeah, this thing is uh, significantly. Uh, different to the F-86 Sabre, but it's, it was based on the same generic uh, plans. But anyway, the um, the Sabre jet was uh, basically the second plane to uh, break the sound barrier. And yeah, this is a Bobby Dazzler. Look at this. Oh, the stubby nose on the thing. Beautiful. But yeah, once again, this thing uh, still flies, although um, the only thing grounding this at the moment is the ejection seat. They need to put a new ejection seat in it. It's still operational, so they get down on the tarmac, they taxi it around and everything, um, but they're not allowed, they're technically not allowed to uh, take off in this thing at the moment. They just need to, but it's fully operational. It fully runs and they can fly this thing. They can, uh, you know, you can still break the sound barrier in this bad boy if you really wanted to, but they, they don't actually push any of their um, airframes to the limits here because, you know, um, they are quite old. There's no reason to, you know, you take them to air shows, you don't, you know, if you go 500 k's an hour, it's uh, it wows people the same as a thousand k's an hour would, so no worries. But yeah, this is actually significantly different to the F-86 uh, Sabre. It's got a different engine in it. So this is a fighter bomber, of course. It did uh, contain and could carry the uh, AM-9B uh, Sidewinder, which you see there, non-operational, of course. Um, but it would could carry uh, a couple of uh, 500 or 1,000 uh, pound bombs plus uh, rocket or uh, optional rocket uh, pods. So it was, you know, primarily uh, ground attack, but, you know, fighter bomber capabilities. So very capable aircraft, the old Sabre. But yeah, this is not an F-86. This is the Aussie version. But this one, this actual unit here, did actually fly with the Malaysian Air Force for a while. Um, and then the RAAF um, bought it back. So yeah, and it's currently operated by uh, one of the RAAF uh, squadrons here. And here we've got a Rolls-Royce uh, Avon Mark 109 engine, which actually came out of one of the uh, Canberra uh, bombers here. So that's a turbojet with 7,500 pounds of thrust and uh, yeah two of those bad boys on the Canberra bomber so there's the technical details for those uh, playing along at home but look at this the cutest thing ever the General Electric J85 this is one of the most efficient uh, thrust per weight engines in the world and this one was uh, from the uh, Dragonfly that we uh, saw in the other hangar so the Dragonfly would have two of these and um, it, this is almost uh, 3,000 pounds it's about just over uh, 28 2900 uh, pounds of thrust so basically um, you know two of those equals one of those like <laughs> there's a huge like this is why that Dragonfly was so capable had two of these tiny little lightweight uh, turbojet engines the J85 and this is the one that they still make today so you can just buy one off the shelf and drop it into your original 1950s vintage Dragonfly aircraft so yeah it's just amazing like it, it is such a good design that they still make it unbelievable and this was also used on uh, early uh, Learjet uh, 20 series aircraft as well so yeah both military um, and civilian use and for you Pratt & Whitney uh, fanboys there you go there's a uh, 1850 radial uh, jobby and uh, what's uh, 1200 horsepower there you go at 12 at 2700 rpm beautiful then we've got the Rolls-Royce Merlin used in the uh, spit famously used in the Spitfire uh, of course so yeah, that's a, uh, a V12 liquid-cooled um, piston 
uh, engine, and it was they had original uh, they had problems in the original Spitfires with the uh, carburetor. If you flew the thing upside down, uh, you'd you'd come and guts her a bit. But uh, I think they fixed that with a um, a change to the valve uh, design of it. But yeah, anyway, there's another right uh, cyclone, then another radial engine there. You can tell it's a radial. You can tell by the radial design like that. <laughs> so yeah, but there you go. Very nice engine displays here. They've got a uh, cutaway um, turbojet here. I'm not sure what that one is. There's no info on it. You see the multi-stage blade design there. That is beautiful. And they've got another radial one there. Nicely cut away too. Extremely simple, extremely reliable, but uh, yeah, like turbojets are the go. Just have another look at that Sabre. Isn't it beautiful? The engine is uh, mounted just behind the uh, kangaroo there so it'd be going back in like that i actually i think this is the engine from the saber don't quote me on that but i think it might be and this bad boy is the boomerang this is the only completely australian designed and uh built uh, military aircraft and uh it dates from uh, 1941 they actually uh designed and manufactured this in 23 weeks. So as soon as uh, Japan uh, <laughs> invaded uh, Pearl Harbor and, um, and did some other stuff, um, the Australian Prime Minister went to an Australian aircraft manufacturer and went, we want a fighter bomber now, give it to us. Um, and 23 weeks later, um, this was operational. They, it was such, such a fast development, they actually uh, didn't produce any prototype at all of this thing. Five of these were already in production before the first one actually flew. So yeah, um, it's spared no expense. So we've got an Australian flag. Beautiful. We've got a drone up there too. BAE uh, Kingfisher drone. Look at that. Oh, that's interesting. Anyway, don't have any details on that. It's just hanging there. But yeah, the, the Canberra bomber, Australian designed and manufactured and uh, entered service in 1940. Two, it was a reasonably capable aircraft, but it wasn't on par with the uh, Japanese uh, Zero. It didn't have the same uh, service ceiling and what and uh, performance and whatnot, but it was reasonably capable. And yeah, they just rushed these into production. So yeah, um, it, it, it's a fighter bomber, so it can do both uh, air to air and um, air to ground as well. But yeah, this used uh, some of the design philosophy and uh, production uh, techniques used in the Wira way, which we uh, saw before. But yeah, quite an Australian designed and manufactured, the only, even to this day, the only uh, Australian designed and manufactured military aircraft to see active service. So that's a Bobby Dazzler. That's the boomerang. Always came back. And that's just a Cessna 01G uh, belonging to the Royal Thai Air Force. Um, not hugely capable, but you know, anyway. And then we have a Ryan uh, PT-22. And this one was a uh, trainer uh, aircraft, but uh, very forgiving aircraft this one take a look at the uh nice bouncy um wheel struts down there so yeah you could uh you know put trainer pilots in this thing and they wouldn't uh, destroy it when they <laughs> when they come into land for the first time so yeah very capable uh trainer aircraft the ryan pt-22 radial engine on it so yeah really tough as nails that one and she looks beautiful too and then oh we've got another spitfire as i said this is the mark 8 uh, Spitfire and uh, this was basically um, air to air not air to ground that's the uh, four rotor jobby they did actually have uh, five rotor and three rotor uh, versions of the Spitfire but yeah this is a Mark 8 there's the technical data for those playing along at home where did this one come from this was the last uh, Spitfire acquired by the Royal Air Force okay uh, their original serial numbers in England 1944 shipped to Australia in 45 Oh, it could actually carry one 500 pound bomb or two uh, 250 pound bombs, but not as capable as the uh, Mark 16, that's for sure. But uh, yeah, Spitfire. And once again, this sucker is still operational. So they've got two operational Spitfires here. Absolutely fantastic. But I think my favourite's the Canberra Bomber. Just like the look of it. And flew higher and faster than anything else here. So 
yeah, it's a beauty. But anyway, there you go. I hope you enjoyed that uh, little tour through the uh, Tamora Aviation Museum. Highly recommended if you're uh, in the area or even make a day of it, uh, drive down from Sydney. It's, it's quite a drive. <laughs> we're driving back uh, tomorrow. We're, uh, we're, we're actually staying on the airfield here tonight. So this is great. I love it. Yeah, highly recommend it coming down here. But if you can get to one of the uh, open days, which I plan on going to, yeah, they wheel these things out and they fly them. But as I said, they do actually uh, take these up about once a month. They take all of them out and uh, take them for a spin. And they've got, um, yeah, the only operational Canberra bomber. There's not very many uh, Spitfires uh, left. Yeah, they've still got the only operational Canberra bomber and a couple of other um, ones that they're only operational, uh, the only operational ones left in the world. But anyway, oh, I missed a Jeep. Okay, for you Jeep fanboys, here you go. Left-hand drive, none of that right-hand drive rubbish. And uh, that's a Willys 4x4, there you go. Classic. <laughs> they made, apparently they made a Jeep every, uh, every couple of minutes or something during the war, but it's got the Aussie flags on it. Ah, beautiful. You do actually see the occasional one uh, driving around Sydney. So anyway, and uh, we've got an 18 pounder Mark II. Look at this. There you go. A few gun aficionados. Beautiful. That's the Anzac Centenary 18 pounder. And uh, it's still in great, look at that. Still in beautiful condition. A lot of spit and polish on that. Ah, brass gears. Thing of beauty. Joy forever. There you go, this just got a video showing them actually flying them around here. Um, <laughs> they just, yeah, I can't believe they actually still fly. Look, and they, these are gorgeous shots. Wow. I'm going to sit down and watch the, uh, watch the video. Lucky bastards who get to fly them. I, I, I did ask and they do not take. Um, <laughs> no matter how important you are, they're not going to take you up in one of these things. Nope. <laughs> It's only the people who work here or the RAAF uh, pilots who um, technically own a couple of these things. But yeah, they've got more aircraft than what's, uh, show, than what's on uh, display here. But yeah, look, still fly these bad boys. Unbelievable. So yeah, if you get a chance to come to the uh, world-renowned Tamora Aviation Museum, um, because it's not just a museum, they actively service and fly these things. You probably saw the uh, grey beard down in the hangar before working on them. Program will begin in one minute. I'm sure we can get that online. But anyway, terrific stuff. I'll take you down. I'll show you in the uh, we'll go back to the engineering hangar for a minute and see if there's anyone working on them. There's one of the uh, grey beards right now who's <laughs> working on these things. But uh, yeah, this is a operational engineering hangar. There's some of the, look at that, some other, some jigs, something like that. They've got uh, like curved jigs that do something. I don't know, leave it in the comments down below, all you aircraft aficionados. But uh, here's the tool chest. They're working on this Hudson right now. And uh, off he goes. And I'm sure they love working on these things. Be magnificent to work on them, even more magnific magnificent to fly these bad boys. Anyway, hope you enjoyed that. If you did, and there's lots of historical, there's lots of historical stuff here as well. So, well worth coming here to check it out. Anyway, hope you enjoyed that. If you did, give it a big thumbs up, and as always, discuss down below. Catch you next time.